Howard University alum. I'm also on the executive board of the uh, National Alumni Association. Uh, and I'm the first of my family to attend Howard, and now there are seven of us. It's an incredible thing. In, don't even do it. In my, t in my time at being at Howard, I've become very accustomed to being in rooms with outstanding people, and outstanding talent. Uh, I was here a week ago for Howard's birthday, for Howard University Charter Day, and that was absolutely fantastic. I expect today to be no different. I've had a brief meeting with our six panelists here. They're all uh, chief information officers at their respective organizations, and I, I'm really expecting a, a, a wonderful, insightful conversation and learning from them all today. So welcome to the uh, Howard University Center for Digital Businesses panel, Tech Talk Titans, presented by Maximus. The inaugural Tech Talk Titans convened uh, distinguished black chief information officers from various organizations. You'll hear the acronym CIO. What I've also learned is that government people talk a lot in acronyms, so please know that I don't know all the acronyms, <laughs> and maybe they don't either. Uh, at a time when black people represent approximately 3.7% of all CIOs employed in the US, this session offers invaluable insight into the experiences, obstacles, and achievements of these trailblazing figures in technology. So thank you and welcome, thank you and welcome you all to Howard University. How many Howard students or alum are in the room right now? I know we have several on streaming. Fantastic, good to see some students here. Any graduate students? They're all undergrad. Fantastic. I would love for you guys to um, consider moving to the front. I'd also encourage you to key in on, you're not looking at television, you're looking at live people who would be happy to answer your questions at the end. Uh, in addition, I'm sure some of these organizations have internships or uh, on-campus opportunities during the school year, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that. Uh, our panelists today, from starting from me and headed down, we have John Russell, CIO of Northrop Grumman. Uh, Glass was supposed to be sitting over here, but he's out of order. <laughs> Glass, Glassford Hall is going to raise his hand. He's supposed to, he told me he was prepared. He's the CIO of Connecticut. Linnea Jones, CIO of the Central uh, <coughs> Intelligence Agency. Linnea. Linnea, I'm sorry. Uh, Nikki Allen, uh, Chief Information Technology and Operations Officer at Boeing. And Venus Goodwine, CIO, Department of Air Force and Space Force. That's worth, that's worth a clap, for sure. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just going to jump right in uh, with, co with questions, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm Derek, too. Derek, did I miss you? <laughs> I did. Derek is the reason we're here today. Derek Pleasure is the Chief Digital Information Officer at Maximum. It threw me off when he sat out of order. It's not my fault. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry, Derek. No, nah, okay. All right, listen. Uh, we have a, a few different areas of questions that we're going to cover today, starting from kind of early career, going through how they're thinking about uh, technology and, the, and, uh, and their jobs today. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting some real insight for you at every level. I know also we have uh, alumni and grad students watching us via live stream and replay right now. Love you to get involved with the Center for uh, Digital Business at Howard. The first section of our questions is about your journey to leadership. Being in government, I mean, leadership is a key word for you all. You understand that that's the, that's the role. So I want to start at the beginning and ask about your early life. Uh, how were you first, first exposed to career opportunities in your field? I, I was told by Nick earlier that the title CIO didn't exist 15 years ago. How did, how did that seed get planted for you? Anyone? I'll call on you, Venus. <laughs> so, no, um, first of all, thank you. I'm excited to be here today and excited to tell you that I am the first African-American female to be the CIO for the Department of the Air Force. Yes. So that's exciting. And then I will tell you that, no, I'm not a Howard alum, but I did send lots of money here. My daughter is a Howard grad. And I also will tell you that Pink and Green is live because this is where we started. So I have to give all those shout outs first, and then I'll tell you about my journey. And um, so for me, having been in IT now for over 36 years, um, I started in the Air Force, and I was introduced to when I, um, I started out in the intelligence community, and I wanted to get a college degree, and I had someone tell me, you should probably get a degree in computers. I said, 
okay, why? And he said, because now this is in 1995, by the way. I said, okay, I'll get a degree then. And, um, and, and what that led to was that first exposure. So I got the degree, computer science. I started to work you know, in industry, still working part-time in the Air Force at this time. But I had no idea of a CIO. But what I knew is I wanted to be in charge. Right? And so that was my first thing. It's like, okay, so I have this job. What's the top job I can have? And so now I'm a federal employee um, working in Okinawa, Japan, because my husband's military. And um, so I asked someone, I said, so if I'm a GS-12, that's a scale for federal civilians. What's the highest that I could be? And she told me. She said, well, you could be a GS-15. I said, oh, that's the highest. She says, no, there's this thing called senior executive service, but that's not us. She looked like me. And I said, what, what does that mean, not us? And so of course, in all things, I go do my research. So I changed my goal. I, said, I want to be a senior executive, a member of the senior executive service. Um, and so that was the first idea and my first indication of the journey that I started. Of one, I knew I wanted to do something that someone told me no one else had done. So that piqued my interest. Um, and then I continued on with my IT and when I went into cybersecurity and now being the CIO, I have the portfolio of not only cybersecurity, IT, but also data analytics, um, uh, data and analytics as well. So now having the portfolio, $17 billion portfolio, 20,000 um, airmen and guardians that I actually manage their career for, but also I'm here to recruit today as well. So I hope throughout this conversation today I could talk to you about the opportunities that are in the Air Force where you don't have to wear the uniform. We have civilian opportunities for you. But my journey really started because someone planted the seed. I had the desire to do something and then someone made the mistake of telling me no. Thank you very much. Does, does the phrase type A mean anything to you? <laughs> I've uh, never been called that. Two things. Uh, for audio control, can somebody maybe consider angling this, moder this uh, monitor away from the microphones? We're getting a lot of feedback up here. And Derek, would you answer the same question? <clears throat> um, sure. Uh, my journey was not um, linear. Uh, I had a lot of different uh, heels and valleys during um, uh, my journey to becoming a CDIO. Um, I wanted to be a film director, and I wanted to be famous. Okay. That's Maybe that. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, again, my, my journey was not linear. I wanted to be a famous film director. Um, so I minored in cinematography in an undergrad and recognized very quickly that, that uh, film, cinematography or film was not for me. Um, so then I went into architecture, that crashed and burned. Uh, went over to communications because I wanted to be a sportscaster, that crashed and burned. Um, and then I got introduced to something called BIT, which is business information technology. So it was the blend between business um, and being in IT. Um, so that's when I kind of got the idea that there's an intersection between business, IT, and outcomes, and I wanted to be at the center of that. So that's kind of where it started um, after I graduated from uh, Virginia Tech. Um, went into the Army, which was the best decision uh, I made in life. Nothing against the Air Force Venus, but <laughs> it's just being in that uniform really taught me uh, about discipline and really serving something higher than yourself. And every person on this stage, that's what we do, service. Um, and I wanted to have a role um, that would allow me to serve as many people as possible. So throughout my career, that's always been sort of a, a undertone to make sure that whatever I do, whether it be engineering, uh, whether it be developing um, software for weapon systems, how can I put as much capability in the hands of war fighters? And now, how can I serve as many people as possible um, through Maximus, which is all about making sure that we're providing uh, government programs uh, to the population on the healthcare side of things, uh, on the benefit side of things. So for me, it's just all about service. And wherever I can serve the most, that's where I want to be. So being sitting in these seats, that gives us a platform to be able to serve, and that's one of the reasons we're also here today, to serve, and selfishly, I want as much talent as possible that I can take, so choose Maximus. I, <laughs> I, I definitely want to hear from everybody on this question. John, you'll sure. go next. So, um, I would say that I think, one, I am honored to be on the stage with such um, talent in the industry, but I think when you ask this question, there's three things that will be recurring themes. One is that each of us had technical engineering talent. Two, each of us had a spirit of leadership 
and three, each of us had resilience because you don't get there without those three, right? So the ability to actually get prepared techno technically from your degree and your education, uh, the ability to lead because that's gonna propel you, and then the resilience because everything is not always easy and you're gonna fail at some point, right? And so you, it's how you react in those moments or is really what propels you forward, right? So I think those are the key things that when you think about your career, when you think about how you're going to get to the levels you wanna to get to, think about the fact, are you prepared? Do you have that kind of energy around technology if you wanna do this field? Um, and are you able to lead? Do people, not just because you have a title, but can you be in a group and people follow you? And then the last thing is, are you tough enough to get through the tough situations? And those are the things that I think will prepare you for. Absolutely. Nikki, how did you first hear about this field? Oregon Trail. Uh, <laughs> So, yes. But no kidding. So I was in elementary school and playing Oregon Trail um, in, in school video on the, the video game on the computer. Um, and, and oddly enough, I've grown past this moment in my life, but I was not a fan of humans growing up. I did not like to talk to people. I was extremely shy, mm -hmm. very introverted. So anything that would keep me in front of a screen, calculating absolutes, math, science, I absolutely adored it. And so I just naturally gravitated towards it. Um, I didn't realize there was a whole career field associated with it. At the time, it was just where I felt the most comfortable. And so, um, like many of you, I was in college and sitting in a room where a group of panelists came from industry, and they each talked about some of the things that they were doing, and Boeing happened to be represented on that panel. I loved aerospace, I loved engineering, I loved technology. So I remember watching the panel and listening, and it was everything from accounting to aerospace and defense to um, retail, and I thought, I am going to work at Boeing. Not only am I going to work at Boeing, I'm going to be the first black female CEO of Boeing. Um, I'm still trying to get there. <laughs> still an aspiration, I'll get there one day. But that, that essentially is sort of how I got into the field of technology. It was because it was where I felt the most comfortable. Um, and throughout my career, I had to learn that you can't just live behind the screen. You actually have to open up, you have to engage. You have to start building that leadership capability and, and be comfortable being visible. Um, so I grew into that over time. But yeah, it was just, for me, it was, okay, I don't have to talk to people. I can talk to the screen. That works for me. <laughs> and that's how I started. I know you've opened up since then. because I have, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Linnea, same question. Sure, so I got into technology, so I, I'm at the CIA and I actually work for the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency uh, together. Uh, I also want to say thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to Howard as well as Maximus for having us here. Uh, it's quite an interesting panel and I feel that we learn from each other and so I'm very proud and happy to be here. And so I got into technology. I uh, enjoyed taking things apart as a child. Um, I do come from a family of service and so locally, uh, uh, my brother-in-law was actually a Chinook pilot in the Army uh, on Fort Meade, so I was very familiar with that. Um, I, as well, I have an uncle who's passed on that was a police officer, and my father who's passed on was also in the service as well and uh, served in the Army. So it's not surprising that a lot of my family members, including myself, work for federal, state, or local government in that way in shape and fashion and form. And so growing up, I was very used to seeing uniforms. I did serve myself as a Naval Sea Cadet, and you know, I promised my, my mother at the time that I would find another way to get another scholarship because the Navy wasn't for me, but I'm gonna, gonna do it. And to this day, I probably learned how to make more knots than I'll ever need to use in life. <laughs> but uh, I also did Girl Scouts and, and those type of things. So when uh, I was in college, I studied mathematics and computer science. Uh, the dot-com industry was very big at that time. Silicon Valley was just getting started. And so, believe it or not, it was during the AOL, um, you've got mail era and that type of thing when, you know, Netflix and Napster and those type of things. If that means anything to anyone, that just means I'm old. But um, what it means is, you know, you used to be able to stream or rip music and that. And I was very intrigued at how technology and mathematics and the STEM field fields were open to anyone and everyone. And so uh, I applied like everyone else. I am a first generation uh, intelligence member in my family. And um, when I came in, I grew up from around NSA, but 
when I grew up, it was called no such agency, right? And so it was a very much cloak and dagger, like, no, nobody go over there, you know, they crazy, that type of thing. And so um, when I first came in, I really didn't know what I was getting into. And I was like, man, this is kind of like a little different, right? And so, um, you know, my first few years were, were rough in trying to understand the culture. Um, you know, there's several things about culture, but cultural eats, you know, tech, eats everything for lunch because the reality is culture drives an organization, it drives you. And so I was very much intrigued. Um, I was really a, a little local hometown girl. I can remember when uh, I met with my my coworkers and colleagues and they were talking about living abroad and, and uh, we call it uh, PCS or permanent change of station. So that's where the government will essentially pack you up and send you to another country. And I can remember my colleagues and coworkers were saying, well, you can live and work anywhere. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll go to like Northern Virginia, you know, and that'll be good. And it just was so my, like my world was so small and like they were laughing at me and I was like, What's so funny, they, you know, and so um, I would say to everyone listening and watching or here today, uh, I, I feel as though um, every opportunity is a lesson and you learn the best lessons from your failures and take risk. You know, I've lived in Japan, I've traveled, I've uh, tried many things. So I always say, you know, try, take the risk and do the things that people may not expect you to do because it actually sets you apart from others and actually gives you more of a a background to understand and grow from. Thank you. Glassford Hall, CIO of Connecticut. How did, you, how did you find out about, how did you aspire to your career? Oh, I was actually, it's by happenstance I got in IT. I was a music major, music guy, played on the offshore band on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, saxophone, I was gonna be the next Grover Washington. <laughs> all, right. all that good stuff. And then when I got to college I realized there was a lot of people better than me. <laughs> and so then I looked at my band teacher and no disrespect, I was like, hmm, ran over shoes. <laughs> you know, I was like, that ain't the career for me. <laughs> so then um, when I was in high school, I went to this computer boot camp, this local mm. company would bring kids in and let them see computers. And I was like, well, you know, the music thing ain't working. Let me try this computer science. So I did computer science, mathematics. I got my degree from Bowie State University. HBCU, all right, hollered out. Um, ended up doing the Beltway Bandits for five years, and then I landed at Northrop Grumman. Um, it was a company called Task at that point, and we did a lot of work in the Intel community. And I was actually a comms engineer. And I used to complain to the IT people how they were impacting my ability to make money. And I complained so much that the president at the time said, well, Mr. Hall, if you think you can do it better, won't you take a job? And so I came to run the local IT department, and as I was doing that, we got acquired by a company, and they said, well, you're doing it, why don't you just keep doing it? And then we got acquired by another company, and then we got acquired by Northrop, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time yeah. uh, to move into it. And so my background with programming and comms allowed me to step into the leadership roles for IT. Um, and then I had a good 20-year run there, and went to Microsoft, and wanted to see, well, how did they do it on that side? And 10 years in Satya and Nadal, and I got a call and this is what I always say, you would be surprised who you run into that how it can come back later in your life. Um, because I got a call from this company called Kinetics. I was like, I don't know. And the guy that called me said, I knew you at Northrop Grumman. Well, I didn't know him at all, but he was talking to me like I knew him. And so they offered me the CIO job and then I got connected with Sean. So I say happenstance because did I really have a plan and a strategy? No, but then once I got into it, I was able to really move forward and it became a passion. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, this is not on the question list, but you all know the answer to this. It occurs to me, especially as we have undergrad students in the audience, that sometimes we connect based on our background, our history. So one word answer, in what city did each of you graduate from high school? Start at this end, we'll go that way. Chesapeake, Virginia. Tampa, Florida. Chicago, Illinois. Linthica, Maryland. Federalsburg, Maryland. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Fantastic. You never know how far that goes. It, it definitely opens doors and lets people uh, feel engaged to you. Uh, on leadership, and Linnea, you mentioned culture. Uh, in what ways do you believe your background or identity has influenced your leadership style and approach to problem solving? Yeah. 
So I'll, I start, I'll start um, a little bit about, I think that's a great question because whether we realize it or not, our experiences make up who we are and it uh, permeates through our leadership style, through how we approach problems, through our thinking, uh, critical thinking, investigation, whatever it may be, problem solving. So I uh, come from a big family. I'm uh, the one of six and the youngest out of six. And so I grew up with a very strong family atmosphere, and so I would say that that relates because I consider my work family like my second family, and I share with them, in some cases, I see my colleagues more than I see my siblings because of the amount of time we're in the building, in the office, and so when you work with someone um, that much, you begin to learn um, who they are. The other thing is I think it's important for people to share who they are and be themselves because in order for someone else to follow you, they need to know who you are as a person, right? And so I believe in sharing um, and being transparent uh, about your journey because you may connect with someone, inspire someone, you may find some way to reach someone in a way that you never thought of, but unless you open up, you'll never get that feedback. But uh, I do think that affects your leadership style and I do think it's more harder to be more transparent and ask questions and let others know that you may not know everything, but the reality is it's all about living, growing, and complementing each other and working together. Anyone else have anything to say on that? Yeah, I'll add. So I have a, and we talked about it earlier, right? Linear versus nonlinear paths. My background is very different, probably from almost all of us on this stage. Um, I grew up below the poverty line. In and out of homeless shelters, foster care, you name it. By the time I was a sophomore in college, I had to get custody of a sibling. Um, so that was my background. So I say that to say it shows up every single day in the way that I lead. Resiliency is probably the biggest thing that I have. It's embedded in my DNA. So when problems arise, when crises arise, when things happen that are unplanned and they're big and they're scary, I run towards them. I lean in because I know if you see it through, there's something incredible on the other side that works out for everyone's benefit. So that shows up in the way that I lead. I also lead with a lot of empathy for my team. Um, it's not just who they show up as every day when we're sitting in a meeting or we're trying to get something done. I know that there's a human there. There's a person inside um, who has all sorts of things going on. It may be caring for a family member. It may be you know, planning the next chapter of their life. It may be planning a big move or a big moment. And so I don't disconnect or decouple the fact that that's a person and they have a life um, and they have things that they're going through. So I'm always mindful of that as a leader. So the resiliency, making sure that I demonstrate compassion and empathy for my team, and then just creating psychological safety. Like when you grew up the way that I did, the hardest thing ever is to go to school knowing everyone in this room probably ate and spent time with their family last night and woke up with their family. I didn't. How do you hide that? Right? How do you, or how do you come to school and perform when you know you have this incredibly different, you know, experience than what your classmates are having? And um, if I just had environments that were psychologically safe, I probably would have relaxed and not have stared at a screen so much. Um, and so I know I take that with me in the way that I lead and lead my teams is creating an environment that's psychologically safe where people can share things and feel like they can open up and not be judged because of it. And so I want to add to that. Um, so for me, leadership is two things. One, when I started, is because I wanted to be in charge. Then when I got in charge, I realized, be careful what you ask for, <laughs> right? right? Because you're the one that's held accountable. But I think it's two sides. One side is authenticity, um, and that is um, I, I have to know who I am. And I can be my authentic self. But let me tell you, because I, I mentor people all the time and I tell them, um, I am different when I go home and I'm around my family. My, my, um, my language gets relaxed. I forget all the Queen's English and I'm, I'm with my peeps, <laughs> okay? When I'm at the office and I'm sitting at the head of the table, I'm still authentic, but I'm not Michelle, who is what my family calls me. I become Miss Goodwine at the mm -hmm. table. Right, and, and so that doesn't mean that I'm not being authentic. So I think um, what I learned that when you say what drove my kind of my leadership philosophy, it is having clear self-awareness, one, as a leader, that was it. The other piece of that is actually understanding, to your point, the people that you work with. 
and understand what they're dealing with and what their challenges are. And you only know that when you start to ask questions. So the other piece is relationships. The ability to build and maintain relationships would drive the type of leader that you are. I may be in charge, but I can never do it by myself. So I spend most of my time drinking a lot of coffee. I go to breakfast every Friday with people that I probably wouldn't eat breakfast with normally because it's about relationships. So I say that in this group, and all of us, I'm sure, can attest, yes, it is about the network that we have and the person that I could call, but I have to have a relationship with them first. And so to me, leadership is, yes, I'm responsible for delivering services to the Department of the Air Force, yes. But that other leadership part is maintain my authenticity, but also making sure that I understand my people through relationships as well. So. How much time do we have for this one? Not all of it. <laughs> all right, it's no. not counseling. <clears throat> Real quick, I wanted to touch on this because I think um, many people conflate, conflate the difference between um, managing and leading, right? Um, you manage tasks and lead people. So for me, I think leadership uh, all starts with empowerment and, and trusting your folks uh, to get things done. Um, so as a influenced by my time in the military. It's about creating this space and capacity for folks to go get their jobs done. Um, and if there's an impediment, then you stick your toes in. But if there's no impediments, you let them go lead. So you let them go do their job. So for me, if, if we're at A and we need to get to D, um, I will give my team the space and capacity to go do B and C. I don't, I don't want to know what you're doing in B and C, but you better get to D. And if there's an issue with you getting to B to D, B, Can you hear me now? Okay, I will help, but uh, again, I think there's a lot of um, hysteria, and I will say that within this space, especially when you come from the in intel community, around people not being able to go do their job without, uh, without saying, mother may I. And for us to get the best out of our people, we need to give them the opportunity to go do and get out of the way. Um, so I'm all about making sure that my folks have uh, the, the space, time, and capacity to go uh, achieve outcomes. Moving forward, uh, you all are the leaders in your role, in your, in your respective organizations. And when that happens, I expect that you impact culture change just as a result of your presence. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about the changes you've seen culturally in your respective organizations, or not even the organizations you're still in, just in the, the field in general, since your time entering to today. And what kind of facets do you think that we, we've done well at and where should we and can we accelerate for uh, improvement? I would say the room has changed. Um, when I started in this role, I was the only person in the room or it could be an offsite of 100 people and I was still the only person. And what I've seen is as we diversity inclusion and you started looking at the ERG groups and you really started being very intentional about bring, pulling people forward, whether it was based on gender, you know, racial, whatever it is, you, you have to be intentional for these things to happen. If you just kind of sit around and hope it happens, you have to be intentional. And you have to sometimes be uncomfortable. You know, people are going to look at you and probably make you feel like, why, why are you talking about that? Or why, why you, if we don't do it, nobody. And I had a gentleman from the agency, um, and he came on and I was- Which agency? Your age. Oh, okay. Your I just want to make sure. Your age. It, it's you a game. Know. It's a joke, right? It's a joke, right? So I, Pete Danny here, and I never forget <laughs> when he, when I got my first job where I could hire a leadership team. And he pulled me in a room and he said, Glass, don't be afraid to build a team that looks like you. Because mm. if you won't do it, mm. nobody's going to do it. Mm. And so mm. I think it's being, I've seen the room change, but I've seen it change because people are very intentional and don't mind causing a little bit of turbulence. Mm. Love it. So. Yeah, I'll take, uh, I'll just pull the thread on that a little bit. Um, I think certainly um, through the course of my career, I've seen where we are often reluctant um, to take a chance on one of our own because of the optics. It looks like we are giving something away. Um, but I will tell you that over the last probably 10 years, that is starting to change. One, because um, technology is so critical. And two, what I tell people is, nobody's ever gonna remember the optic when your team is performing and it's successful. Mm. Pick the right person and forget all the rest. Mm. 
right? At the end of the day, that's what changes culture. If you think about the performance and what's gonna happen, don't worry about what it looks like, worry about what it feels like, right? At the end of the day, that performance feels good to your team, as well as the organization that you're supporting. And then the other is, it's, it's great to have allies, right? We, on ERGs, we always talk about allies. But who wants to be an ally to someone who won't take the, ch the chance themselves, right? If you're not willing to take the chance, why are you asking me to take the chance, right? So I think what you're seeing and hearing here is that we've learned that we have to be willing to take that chance ourselves. We can build the allyship that we need to, to scale. Allyship is around scaling, but the change in the culture starts right here at the leadership. I was gonna chime in, so um, I was joking with Glass, right? So uh, CIA is the oldest intelligence agency, and so we're about 70, we had our 75th birthday about two years ago, so we're roughly 77. Uh, NSA is the second oldest, and so it's a long standing in the intelligence community. Of CIA considers himself the agency, and so, but shout out to all my NSA brethren, because I am NSA as well, but it's just an insider, so I just wanted you all to know part of the joke is that's why it's a big deal, the agency, because if you're at NSA, they do see them, and everybody has the right to be who they are, where they are, right? And so, but I just thought that was funny. Uh, reflecting on your journeys, uh, what are some of the lessons or insights you wish you had known earlier in your careers than you, than you, than you did? What can you impart on these young students uh, in terms of early career information that you wish you'd known earlier? If I could chime in, and this also goes to kind of John's uh, topic, right? So it, when you ask the question about like allies and mentors, uh, I would share, and I'm, I'm very transparent in my journey, that my biggest advocates and allies were white males um, that actually pulled me up and gave me an opportunity to excel and succeed. And so even to this day, I still know kind of my early on mentors. And I think the other thing too is one of the reasons why I echo transparency is because uh, I felt that finding ways to connect with people other than say your gender, your race, um, allows people to see themselves within you, right? So whether it be my background or whether it be, you know, uh, knowing the service or having relatives in the army or the air force or, or services like that, I think that provided that connection. Um, the, the other piece of that I wanted to say is, you know, as you go along your journey and, you know, when you're coming up, don't be afraid to ask people um, for questions and to reach out to understand. You know, I, I think that I myself am, am a product of that, of whether it be from buying my first house at like 21. I didn't, I even, I didn't even think that was possible. And I remember my colleagues were like, no, I thought there was like an age limit, but I just didn't know. <laughs> if you don't know, you don't know, right? And I, I value that partnership of being able to just kind of ask people, how do you do this? And I, I don't disagree with that everyone is going to be a welcome with open arms, but I do think that um, giving people a chance, you might sometimes be surprised with what you learn. Um, the last piece I want to talk about, uh, an echo of what brought me to CIA specifically is, a lot of people may not realize it, but uh, CIA uh, was the, the first and right now the only element that's had a uh, female director, if you would, that's a cabinet member. So uh, a little while ago, Gina Haspel, director Gina Haspel was the first female uh, director of the CIA. And uh, I was actually recruited by a previous female CIO uh, who's actually actually now my supervisor, but uh, her name is Julianne Galena. And I can remember when I first came to CIA, and we do a lot of meetings, as you all might expect, I was taken aback that there were more women in the meeting than there were men. And in the technology field, that's very odd. That's, that is not the norm. And so coming from a defense uh, ecosystem, I mean, I can go to the Pentagon now, and you walk the halls, and all the halls are all men, um, as well as it's in DOD by far and large, there's more men than women. And so I can remember just being stunned that I was in DOD and I was looking at all of these female leaders from the CFO to the chief, the chief financial officer to the chief operating officer to you know deputy directors and that. And so 
I feel as though that encouraged me because I felt that some of those ceilings had been broken and so it kind of gave me the courage to go on. And so um, I, I would encourage people to, because you don't know what you don't know, but sometimes you'd be widely surprised. Um, the last thing, and I promise I'm going to give the mic back after this, is if you guys don't know, on CIA's 75th anniversary, um, they actually erected a statue of Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman is actually right outside of our auditorium, and she's like the original spy, OG spy, back in the day. And so, um, yes. That, as you can tell, it brings me great joy. Uh, our director, Bill Burns, I personally you know, said thank you because it took courage for them to do that, for him to do that, and to see her. And it's actually, he said, it's built in her exact likeness. I mean, she got the gun and everything, y'all. Like, for real, like she got the satchel. And so I just share that because when I go to CIA and when I see her out there, it makes me know I made the right decision. I love that. That's yeah, fantastic. That's story. So I'll, I'll uh, step in on this one. I think and then, and then the, I need 30 seconds real quick, please. <laughs> uh, what was that? Go. Go. Uh, all right. Um, the things that I would actually recommend, one is to find coaches and mentors as soon as possible so that you can learn from them, right? I think there is so much wisdom to be learned and it'll accelerate. And then earn sponsorship. You can't ask for a sponsor. You got to earn, right? So, and that's through performance. And so uh, I'll, I'll call Derek out on this one. So when I first met Derek, uh, he was the lead technical guy on this thing called SPS. And he really impressed me. I was in the room with him. It's like, this, this gentleman's got, you know, he's got some talent here. And so I watched him for a while um, and uh, watched him grow. I also saw that he worked for somebody. I was like, it, this looks backwards. The person he was working for looked like he should have been working for him. And so, um, but um, over the course of time, I got to know Derek and he earned his sponsorship and really just has, uh, in my opinion, you know, gone above and beyond what I ever expected of him. Uh, but the point was when you see talent, right? When you see it performing, our role is to open the doors, to pour into that talent and to help it reach its potential. And I think that's what everybody on the stage does on a day-to-day -day basis for the aspiring students like yourselves out there. But the whole point really is come in, get to know network people, but actually show up. Because when you show up, you get noticed. And when you get noticed, doors get open for you. Um, to the point that someone will see you, take interest, and then kind of pull you in and show you the ropes, right? Uh, that doesn't come automatically. So I want to make sure that as you're entering in your career, you take that, really figure out how to get in contact with the right people, and when you're on stage, kill it. Um. So I worked for John uh, for five years, and I do appreciate your mentorship, sponsorship, because I certainly would not be sitting in this seat if it wasn't for you. But I want to uh, take a trip down memory lane to give some real context around how you, how you uh, used to mentor me. So uh, in June of 2009, uh, we were trying to solve a very difficult technical problem. Um, and there were some, uh, the culture around that time was, look, if something can't be done, it just can't be done. So. Maybe on, on, on a particular morning, I went into his office and said, look, man, um, I know what you asked me to do, but what you asked for, it, it just can't be done. He's like, look, man, I, I'm not going to accept that. Go figure it out. So maybe like a couple days later, I came back to him again and said, listen, we, we looked at a bunch of different AOAs, analysis of alternatives. This, this thing is really difficult and can't be done the way that we architected the system. Go back to the drawing board, figure it out. I came in on a Friday and said, look, man, he said, stop. <laughs> And I paused for a second and, and thought to myself, he, did this man really just tell me to talk to the hand in, in front of people? And I was really upset about it, but it was a good lesson. Um, and the lesson was remove the word can't from your vocabulary and, and think about how to. It, it, it's in how. How can I fix something? How can I look at a problem differently to get to um, the answer that you're looking for? So never say can't. Um, always bet on yourself. and. Um, if someone says stop to the hand, talk to the hand and go ahead and listen to them and get back to the drawing board. So did I appreciate you, you for did that. Did you solve the problem? I did solve the problem. 
That's fantastic. But I do want to add to that yes. because I think it's important um, for me and what I would tell my younger self is one, don't accept no from someone that doesn't have the authority to tell you no. I mean, you must ask questions. If someone says no, you say, can you show me that in writing? If someone says no, say why not? Because I think we're giving this generation a bad rep, right? I think this generation now, today, is going to be the one to break a lot of additional barriers that we've always um, broken, already broken. The other thing is, um, I don't focus on the fact that I'm the only, and that um, when I walk in the room, I might be the only woman, or I might be the only um, female, um, or the only of color, I should say. What I focus on when I'm in the room, regardless of the room, that I'm gonna do what you said. I'm gonna perform and I'm gonna bring it. How do I do that? One, I'm very deliberate with my career. I've been very deliberate from day one. How so? When I decided in 2006 I wanted to be a CIO because someone told me I couldn't, they said no, and I said, why not? And so I created, no kidding, a spreadsheet. Yes, I'm A-type. Um, and, and no kidding. So I'm saying this to you because I want you to, to take this if you're hearing my voice. Down the, the first call, Excel spreadsheet. We talked about Excel, right? Excel spreadsheet. Um, in that first column, I had all the competencies for the job that I wanted. Across the top, I put all the jobs I had had. Um, because I've been military, I've been industry, I've been active duty, I've been reserved, so I had some experience. And then where the intersection of a job and a competency match, I put an X. When I was done, I had a pictorial view of what my career looked like. I knew exactly what I was missing in order to get the, all the squares filled, like bingo, so to speak. And so every decision I made about my next job was because I needed a new skill that I was going to acquire. A skill I had was past 10 years, so I needed to update it. And so I use that, and I say, you have to be deliberate in your career. The other thing is, and I use the mnemonic of people, yes, coaches, mentors, but there's the other side of that that's our responsibility. And I say people because it is pursue every opportunity learn continuously, make sure I know how to spell people, and make, learn continuously, and make sure that you are excited about successes and failures. Because when you fail, that is a training ground for opportunity and learning. And so what I would have, back then, I didn't know that, I was just moving real fast, but when I finally realized what I wanted to do, and it took me a minute, in 2006, I will tell you we have in the Air Force, we have senior executives, and you're tier one, you're tier two, and you're tier three, and it's a progression. I've been fortunate because what I'm telling you work. When I applied for my tier one job, I got it. When I applied for my tier two job, I got it. When I applied for my tier three job, I got it. I had three interviews, three jobs. So I'm telling you, be deliberate in your career. Don't accept no, and know what you want to do. And to me, that's what was helpful with my type Fantastic. A Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have an early, uh, 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 something to add in terms of something you wish you'd learned earlier in your career? Yeah, I'll pull on it a little bit, and it's around, well, so here's the funny thing. What she just described to you all, I have the exact same thing. I call it my career roadmap. Um, and I guarantee you, every one of us on this stage probably has a version of it. It works. Um, so take the time to do it. And it's not a, I'm in the middle of, you know, going from one class to the next, or I have something to do and I'm going to take a few moments. It's a sit quietly for the next four to six hours and figure this out and be intentional. And here's what I learned. So I've been at Boeing almost 25 years. I started as an intern. When I started full time, I was actually supporting structural systems for our fighter jets, for F-18s. And I got tapped on the shoulder within six months of starting full time and they said, you're gonna get promoted. And I thought, this is great. And then eight months later, I got tapped on the shoulder again and I got promoted again. And I said, wow, this is amazing. So here I am being programmed to think, if I just show up, do my job every day and I do it well, I'll get promoted. Somebody will see it, they'll tap me on the shoulder and the next thing will come. So sure enough, the third shoulder tap came and I got promoted. And every single time it was someone who was either a mentor or a sponsor or someone who I thought, hey, they see me. They see me and they know me, they know what's best for me. And I get this third job and I hate it. I hate it. I'm like, I'm like every day I hate it. And at the time, we had a policy that had just changed where if you got in a new job, you had to stay for 12 months. And I knew I hated it two weeks in. So I went through all the stages of grief, 
right? Why would Kevin do this to me? He clearly sabotaged me. Um, you know, I was angry at the world. And then I had to take a moment and reflect on how did I end up here? And I ended up here because I allowed people who didn't know me as well as I know me make decisions for me. And I trusted them. So the piece that was missing in that entire equation is that my own intentionality was not there. I didn't know what I wanted. And I, didn't, and I wasn't very intentional about how to get what I wanted. Um, I just thought, I'll show up every day, do a great job, someone will see me and believe in me, and you know, all will be great from there. So um, I spent those 12 months in that job architecting my career roadmap. I said, I will never go through this again, right? Um, and I did the work, and I did a great job, but I was very intentional from that moment on. And so one of the things I always tell, I have a, a, a my youngest son right now is at Morehouse, so he hears this from me all the time. Uh, my older two sons have since graduated, and one is actually an engineer with me at Boeing today. Um, one of the things I always tell them is, early in your career, it's okay to say, almost think of it like Waze, it's okay to say, I want to go from Philadelphia to D.C. You put that in Waze, it'll get you in the area. Once you get to D.C., you may go see some monuments, you may do a little sightseeing or what have you. But at some point, you have to put some addresses in. Mm, that's right. right? You have to say, take me from Philadelphia to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You can't just rely on everybody else to tell you what's best for you or tell you what vicinity you need to be in because you've been you and you know you more than anyone else does. Um, and so that was the biggest moment I had early in my career is it's okay for people to believe in you and have sponsors and have mentors, but make sure you know what you want so you know what to say yes to and you know what to say no to. Absolutely fantastic. I'd, I'd like to add my own personal lesson, career lesson, I'm not a CIO but <laughs> I've got kids also. And one of the things that I would say, especially to you undergrad students, that I think is important is that you get what you inspect, not what you expect. Mm -hmm. And the way that plays out in career is sometimes you'll imagine I want to be dot, 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 insert any career title. And then you may not actually know what a day in the life of that career looks like. That's how you use this panel and the people that work for them and with them, is you inspect what it is that they do by asking a question like, Derek, give me a day in the life of being a CIO according to your, your average month. <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> no. Uh, it's, it's just about... Um, challenges and problems, right? And how you're gonna solve them. There's going to be a problem every single day. So what, one of the things I talk to my team about is there's always going to be a thing. There's gonna be a hard thing that we're gonna to have to attack. You're gonna to have to collaborate across the business to make sure that you, you have alignment with all the other leaders to solve a particular problem. But as soon as you're done with that one, there's another alligator close to the boat that you still have to kill. So you, you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, yeah. meaning there's problems that are always gonna be, gonna be occurring every single day. So you sort of internalizing that and recognizing that it's your entire job uh, to solve problems and to remove friction. Uh, so folks can get things done across the organization. That goes for the CIA, Air Force, Space Force, Boeing. Doesn't matter. This is what what we do on this on on this stage is remove friction and remove impediments so people can get their jobs done. <laughs> that that that's our whole existence. But I do want to riff on something because uh, we were talking about careers, three jobs, three three. Um, something I learned last year, I spoke at a, um, a women's forum and I had the opportunity to take uh, nine women out to dinner at the same time, which was um, very interesting. Never took nine women out on a date before. But um, what I learned was, was something that was really stunning and that was um, a lot of times uh, females and even if you're from a diverse community, you'll read a job description. If you don't fit every single requirement on that job description, then you won't apply. That's really destabilizing because outside of our community, that doesn't happen. There are folks that will bet on themselves. They may only fit half of the requirements, but they still apply and they get the job. So I think we, you young folks out there, you have to be willing to bet on yourself. And if you feel like you have an aptitude to get, to get a job and you can get into there, you can learn and, and you can crush that job, then you need to apply and bet on yourself. And I will assure you, all of us have applied for a job and asked ourselves, do we think we can really do this job? But we had the courage to do it anyway. So courage is something that is in the DNA of every single person on this stage. And I think all of us need to make sure and um, socialize within our community that if you don't fit all the requirements, that's okay. Do it anyway.
We have something at Howard for sure called uh, irrational confidence. So <laughs> this audience, if they don't have it yet, they will get it. And, but I love the fact that you said that also. That is definitely a key. Glass, at this uh, position in your career, this elevation of your career, is it mostly people or mostly technology that you're dealing with? Uh, probably a mixture of both. But I, I think the, the one thing I'll say about my role, as I was telling somebody, I have the unique opportunity to be a CIO for a former, very successful CIO in industry. And um, what she's looking for for me is how do I enable the business to grow? I mean, the operation th stuff is there and all, but I have a team to do that. What, her, what she's looking for is how are you going to enable me to get to that next level? How do we get to that billion dollars? How do we get to acquiring the next company and not having impediments? And so. Uh, what I find when I go in on a day-to-day -day basis is I really figure out how am I going to enable the business, what outcomes is she looking for, you know, and how do I, what's the goals and how do I measure whether I achieve the outcome, whether it's revenue or whether it's some peak growth or what have you. So I, I think as you get into the roles and, and whatever role you get, you just want to understand what is the outcomes or the desires of, the, what, what is the organization you're supporting, what is their overall objective? I mean, because the CIO went from probably 20 years ago, it was like this technical guy, he ran IT or she ran IT, and then it became more of a business role. You, you became part of the C-suite, yep. you became an enabler, helping to drive revenue and things of that nature. Because if you look at where industry is going, you know, I'm outsourcing everything. I got cloud and I, have, I don't have the operational team and all that I used to have in the past. And it's really driving business. And so my team is made up of all kind of business type mindset specialists, subject matter experts around those things. And so I think it is, when I look at it, and I probably diverge from your question, but I, I think when you look at the CIO role, you, you look at it as more of a business opportunity, and, and you want to see it as a taking a lot of your experience and bringing to the table on well you make decisions. And so my day is, I would say, is looking at how I'm going to enable the business to do more Understanding operations is, is, Sean said, that's table stakes. It better work. <laughs> but your real job is helping me grow this business. Right. You are definitely C-suite yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Linnea, uh, moving to the innovation and strategy segment, I'd like to start with you on this question. How do you balance the need for innovation with the practical considerations of risk management mm -hmm. and maintaining operational stability? And how do we safely stay technology competitive globally in this modern environment? Sure. So uh, I think uh, Venus said it earlier, you know, I'm very honest that we can do nothing by ourselves. Everything is a team, a group effort, right? So uh, just to kind of share vernacular, a lot of times people talk about your digital C-suite. So for us, that's the chief information officer, that's the chief data officer, um, that's the chief information security officer, the CISO, and now probably the newest to the bunch is the chief um, our artificial intelligence officer. So um, we have an AI officer chief as well now. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you talk about balancing innovation. One thing that I love about technology is it's always changing, it's always uh, growing, always evolving in something new. And I think that um, with that, if you look at the CIA mission, a lot of times people you know, uh, we, um, we're very fortunate to be in many movies and books and many things, but I like to always say, you know, at, at the foreground, the Central Intelligence Agency is a foreign intelligence agency, right? And so we are a global mission. So although uh, we, we may be local, we are in, in countries all around the world. So it's a global mission. So there really is no downtime. Every day, every minute, every hour, someone is on somewhere, sometime, somehow, because the mission never stops, right? It's a job that never closes and never opens because it's always on, right? And so I share that because even if you talk about leadership style, I will open things saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we're reaching the whole world simultaneously. And when you talk about innovation and risk management uh, within CIA, we specialize in human intelligence um, and clandestinity, which is more of your traditional, but each one of the intelligence agencies and elements specializes in a different area. So a lot of times people say NSA, they specialize in signals intelligence, which we short call SIGINT. Um, the 
National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They specialize in geoint or geospatial intelligence, so think of geography uh, again. And so we all have our, our own um, item that we are known for, and I would say the CIA was actually founded during the wartime from open source intelligence. That's how CIA actually became who they are, because they were using, at that time, papers and radios and that to draw intelligence value from our adversaries to see where we are. And so when you talk about innovation, I think that this is a, an amazing time. If we look at how technology has influenced the way we live, work, operate, and do everything we do. There isn't a person on the planet that isn't, hasn't been influenced by tech in some way, shape, fashion, or form, whether they realize it or not. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us to get involved. Now, for us, from an intelligence value perspective, we are looking at you know, foreign intelligence in order to create um, a safer world for Americans here and abroad. But I think also it's important that you look at this from a complementary point of view, right? Um, in the intelligence community, we are like a family. It's one of 18. Uh, shout out to, to Venus. Space Force is the newest, newest kid on the block. And so um, all 18 of us specialize in our area, but we work together as one team, one voice, and one mission. I think that's very important to do that. Innovation right now, you, hands down, you talk to anybody, AI ML is going to eat it up. AI, I mean, it's, it's so amazing to me because I feel like the AI moment is where cloud was 10, 15 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't go anywhere, anytime, and not hear someone speak about cloud. Now you can't say AI ML fast enough. But I, I ask people to, to look at it from a different perspective. Although artificial intelligence and machine learning is being spoken about right now, this is not new. Not. This is not something that just came up in the last few years. You know, as many of us on the stage are mathematicians. It's really classical probability and statistics and looking at sampling sizes. The more data you have, the more accurate your results become. Of course, good data in gets good data out, so bad data in, bad data out. But uh, right now, I think the reason why AIML is, is coming to the forefront because it's being coupled with other technologies to enable it. So if you couple AI ML with 5G, or if you couple AI ML with quantum, or if you couple, and so because of that, now it is changing the paradigm, as well as you're talking about natural language processing, or NLP, right? And so the way now, you know, with whether you work or, or operate, you can type into Google a sentence and it'll talk to you like a person. <laughs> And so that is just showing the ingenuity of innovation. And I think it's exciting for, for us because in the IC, we always want to uh, have insight and understand about what's in the forefront because we're looking from our data protections. I'm sorry, the intelligence community, yes. Yes, um, within the intelligence community, we're looking at data protections. How do we use data? How do we condition data? How do we coalesce data together? Because that's how you bring intelligence value, if you would. And so that innovation, very excited. Um, it's, it's not a, a, a secret that we in the intelligence community partner across industries. So we have thousands of partners and businesses that we work with, um, one team, one mission. But we're looking at what they can bring to augment the things that we're doing to work together to make better solutions. Follow-up question on that. Are the benefits of the tool, AI as a tool, do they outweigh the risks, the early risks of use? I think it's all about risk management, right? So AI is not, AI is more of a broad brush of umbrella, AI ML, the same way cyber is. Cyber is a spectrum. You could have cyber intelligence, you could have cyber security, you can have just a myriad of solutions in that. And that's the same way. AI ML is enablement. It's a way to do things, but it's, it, and it's its own intelligence value as, as it has. But you know, I think one thing that's very key in the intelligence community that we will always echo is that when we are working with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the intelligence community, it's with authorities, it's with oversight, and it's always with a person in the loop, right? And so, again, it's a, it's a different mission, and so we look at artificial intelligence and machine learning to augment the work that we're doing, not replace, but to help us in doing that, because we're getting you know, a, a deluge of data, right? So everything produces data right now. Um, you, Sometimes people talk about IoT, the Internet of Things, and so the Internet of Things is, you know, your 
machine, a washing machine, and your refrigerator now can tell you what you need to buy from the grocery store, and all that digital connectedness. And so with so much data being produced from a, a technical and a digital spill, if you look at that, you want to be able to allow the computers and the systems to help work through that information. Yeah. Yeah. John, same question. Uh, how do you, what's the strategy for balancing that risk with uh, staying globally competitive? Yeah. So I, I think the, the key here, and you said strategy, right? So as a CIO, you have to be the curator of technology, right, at the end of the day, because you can chase a lot of shiny objects that don't drive business value, right? You could spend a lot of money that don't generate revenue. And so you really need to understand and be deliberate around the technology that you're going after. It should be rooted in your organization's strategy, right? How are you? So what I love about Northrop is that when we do a corporate strategy, it is what are you bringing to the table for the organization to hit the organization's aspirations, right? Number one in aerospace, whatever it is. Um, so from a technology standpoint, and then the business units will put their aspirations and then they're looking to say, and CIO, how are you gonna help me get there, right? And so, so the, the real opportunity is to understand the technology landscape, to then be able to apply it to the problems and the business um, aspirations that you need to. And that's the real key, in my opinion, to kind of putting your focus where it needs to be because you will have 10,000 different technology capabilities out there that look great, but at the end of the day, they just might be a shiny object and you're wasting your time because you're not moving your organization's kind of agenda forward. I think it depends on how you define innovation and risk. We all almost jumped to the mic when you talked about risk, because it depends on what your risk posture is. Yeah. Um, I'm Department of the Air Force, and our job is to provide air power, space, provide space power. And in that power projection, how is it that I make sure that the warfighters have what they need when they need it? I have to get it right every time. So for innovation for the Department of the Air Force, it could be innovation something new, or it could be uh, a new way of doing something that I already have. You, you might imagine as a CIO, I'm constantly asked for meetings for people to show me their new shiny toy. Well, I don't have a lot of money to buy a whole lot of new shiny toys, right? Um, and so, because every time I buy a new toy, I gotta take another toy out my box. You know how with your kids, right? You said, okay, I'm gonna buy you this toy for Christmas, you gotta get rid of some others. It's the same way as a CIO, because I don't have this endless money. And so what we want from you know colleges and university is from that innovation, and for them to have the mindset, which starts with curiosity. How curious are you? But I have to set an environment that you could come into the organization and then channel that curiosity and then I need to give you a playground to do it. And then what comes out of it is measured by, in, in my world, time in warfighter hand. It's not delivery, because I can deliver something and put it on the shelf. It's when the warfighter uses it and says, thank you, it meets my need. Now again, I don't do that singularly. I do that collectively. Some of these are my partners today that are helping me deliver innovative solutions to the warfighter. But I want the college students to understand, undergrad and, and graduate that, bring that innovation, bring your curiosity to the workplace because I will tell you, I, 36 years I've been in the Air Force. Um, I probably could think of some creative things but I guarantee you with your experiences, you could bring some other things that I probably never thought about. So think of the people that are in our organization who have been there for a long time. We're used to doing things our normal way. We need that innovation to come. And the risk is really, um, what's the trade-off? Does it add value? And value is not measured just in dollars, right? It's valued, it's measured in how well it either meets the mission. And so we need that innovation to come in. So I think setting a place um, for individuals to come in and be curious and a lot in us taking advantage of that curiosity. To me, that's innovation and the risk um, combined. Awesome. I just want to make sure you all know that you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions as we approach the end. We're in our last half hour, so I'm going to move us forward. Uh, and the segment is empowering the next generation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go off script for one second, and I know that many of you have opportunities in your respective organizations for recruitment. Yes. What does that look like? What is, what is being offered? What should these students be aware of? Um, anyone want to start? Just go. Just go. Yeah. We are always looking for good people at CIA. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think 
I just want to share, I would encourage everyone that sometimes you might say, you know, I can't see myself there, but CIA is everyone. And so we could not do a foreign intelligence mission without having a very diverse group of people um, living all around the world to do the mission every day. Um, I also think within the government, um, it gives you a little bit difference, right? So a lot of times, and, and I would say all of our colleagues here have different paths, but um, one thing is common, uh, many of us have a background of service, right? Um, servant leaders, whether working with the, you know, the forces or working with folks in government or alongside them in at teaming and community and camaraderie. Uh, we at CIA, of course, we, we do recruit uh, CIA.gov, and so that's probably the most direct and easiest way. Um, we do do social media and that type of thing, and I would say that there's a, a Everything you can think of that exists um, within the intelligence community has one, right? So whether it be from doctors to lawyers to strategists to just about everything. I, I say that because most people don't think about um, a human resources person uh, in, in the IC. We even have our own photographer, and uh, I thought it was interesting that Derek was talking about being a movie producer. We even have film producers and that type of thing in there. And are so, you hiring? <laughs> we are always <laughs> always looking for good people. But you know, it's uh, it's fascinating. I think the other piece is with the Central Intelligence Agency, as well as many elements. You typically do have um, a little bit broader opportunities to live and work abroad. Um, there are many people that serve on behalf of CIA that may live outside of the United States for decades, if not more, uh, as well as the traveling, uh, going places and doing things. And I think also the mission is, is interesting. Uh, CIA is the only element whose director is a cabinet member. And so with that being uh, interesting. I sit on both sides, on the Department of Defense side as well as on the CIA side. And so I'll, I'll share a little bit about the difference. Uh, at NSA, the National Security Agency, NSA is considered a combat support agency. And you were right, like we live in acronym world, right? That's all the time. And so NSA is a combat support agency and they are led by a four-star general um, who is the director of NSA and the uh, chief of US Cyber Command, right? And so then the director of NSA essentially uh, will report to the Secretary of Defense, right? And then the Secretary of Defense report to the president, right? So you can see there's some layers in there. And I will say, although you don't see it, in between SecDef and NSA, it's uh, the Undersecretary of Defense and Intelligence. So there's a USDINS, right? So it's funny because on NSA, it's like NSA, then it's USDINS, and it's SecDef as president. On the CIA side, it's like director, CIA, president, right? So <laughs> it's just very different. And although we work together, I share that because it's a different ecosystem. NSA, you know you're with DOD. You feel DOD, you see the uniforms. CIA is a different mission, but I would say across the IC, more than ever, we're, they're all, we're all on LinkedIn. I'll be honest, guys, I spend so much time on my own like computer tech, I actually, my way of decompressing is not using tech at home, but I would encourage you that uh, phenomenal opportunities as well as bonuses and training programs for different things. Um, and we also do mid-career hires or second or third or fourth careers. Sometimes people will retire and then come back to CIA. Um, you'd be amazed at the community and um, what you could provide and I would encourage you to try if you're interested. Derek, what do the opportunities look like at Maximus? Maximus hires thousands upon thousands of people every single month. Um, it's hard to, to really keep up with, but I think um, where we're trying to differentiate um, ourselves as a corporation is that we recognize that we're competing uh, for the attention of the young folks and the mid-career folks. So our name is not as big as the Northrop Grumman's or uh, the Boeing's of the world. But w what's important for us to, to get out to, to the young people is um, mission matters. And the service component of that, if we can explain the why, why you should come and then, you know, um, the, when you support a specific mission, how that makes you feel, this generation wants to know that too. It's not just about going to, um, you know, clock in, well, no one really clocks in anymore, but, you know, be there from eight to five doing a specific thing. It's like, wh what does it mean? What am I doing and what does that mean impact-wise to the world? So I think all of us need to figure out how to get that right, and that's something that we're really 
um, we have a visceral attention on how are we going to make sure that young folks understand that you don't just come here for a job or a career, you come here to make a difference. And that's something that all on social media, you'll, you'll, you'll get that we have a phenomenal um, outreach team. Um, but I think all of us need to, to be thinking in a different way to reach the young folks that are out there because if you're not, if you're not able to articulate the why or um, be able to articulate what is meaningful for them, I think you're going to lose them because every single day there, there's so many outlets that they can get information from. There's so many people competing for, um, you know, attention. It's just that you have to be able to differentiate yourself. So we're kind of thinking hard about how do we actually do that. We've been successful, but we have a lot more work to do for sure. Yeah. So that, that, there's my question is what is the CTA, right? What is the call to action? You've got audience, mm -hmm. you've got remote audience. What is their takeaway from this if they want to take the next step, the action step towards you, your career, your organization? What do you need them to know? What do you need them to do? Um, I want you to know that in the Department of the Air Force, every job that's in society is also within the Air Force doesn't matter. You want to be a veterinarian? We have them in the Air Force. You want to be an aerospace engineer? We have them in the Air Force. You want to be an astronaut? Come to the Air Force. And no matter what it is that you want to do, um, we have those jobs in the Air Force. And you can do them in different capacities. You don't have to, if you don't want to serve and wear the uniform, we have an entire civilian population um, in the Air Force as well. Also, um, if you want to work for the Air Force in a contractor, per, contractor capacity, we have partnerships with the contractors on this stage that support us, so you can support us that way. So what I'd want you to do, if you're interested, um, if you go to any of your search engines or any of your Indeed, um, monster jo jo monsterjobs.com, and just search Air Force job, you're going to get a link, apply. But I'm going to encourage you that if you're right now still in, stu in school, not have graduated, come and be an intern with us. And, not in, and because you can try us out. Come try us out and see if this is what you want to do. Because once you become an intern, if you decide, I've interned, I think this Air Force thing is pretty good, then now I can make you a palace acquire. And that just gives you a three-year promotion cycle, and we move you around to different parts of the organization so you get the holistic view. So between, besides one coming in as an intern, you could be a palace acquire. We have those programs across all of the Air Force, and you can get them on Indeed. But the last piece, too, especially, you know, hearts out to Howard University because the Air Force signed our first UARC, our university-affiliated research agreement with Howard University, $90 million, so that Howard could help us on autonomy research. Get involved in that if that's what you're interested in. And not only that, UARC, even though it's led by Howard, they also brought in some of the other um, universities to help as well. So there's a lot of opportunities. So just go look, search, and if push come to shove, if you still get stuck, I'm on LinkedIn. Good wine, like a good glass of wine, and I will respond. But I do have my Stratcoms team. He's here, and he will give you our our global page as well, because we know that there is a talent for war, but I want you to not get stuck just in the money. I want you to be tied to the mission that you want to serve, where's your passion, and I want you to consider your entire compensation package. You can go make $100,000, but if you don't have any medical insurance, it's not a whole lot of $100,000. But if you go somewhere and they pay you less, but give you full medical dental vision and travel and pay time off and pay for further education, compare that. So I want you to consider that when you think about that. Take, take a break before you go on. If you all have questions, I want you to start a line at the microphone. Uh, that's how we'll know that you have questions. There's a microphone here in the middle aisle. Uh, until we see someone there, we'll continue with answers here. I saw your hand up, class. No. Oh. So, we are hiring. Boeing is always hiring. We are 171,000 strong and growing constantly. Um, you know, Lene mentioned it earlier, we're in 65 countries, so we are a global company. You have the opportunity to work on a ton of different products. One of our um, sort of strong missions at Boeing is that we protect, connect, and explore the world. And what does that mean? We have everything from from um, defense platforms, whether it's fighter jets, um, aerial refueler tankers, all of the things that we need to make sure our war fighters come back home safely as they're protecting us, to commercial aircraft, which I'm sure most of you have flown on and probably are more familiar with when it comes to Boeing. We also have satellites. Um, we have underwater uh, autonomous vehicles. We have autonomous vehicles in the air. So we, I work at a company that has 
no kidding you, product across all what we call all five domains, right? Space, air, land, sea, you name it, and cyber. Um, so if you have an interest in working on things, actual things, tangible things, um, standing on a launch platform and actually watching a rocket take off that you know you had a hand in helping design and build, that's an incredible feeling. So if you're a mission-oriented, mission-driven person and you'd like to actually see the product that you make and see people consume it, whether it's a warfighter or a, uh, or a civilian, come to Boeing. So we have everything from internships to full-time opportunities as well as really great rotation programs. So if you're not exactly sure what you want to do full-time but you'd like to get in the door and maybe spend six months, um, every six months over the course of three years rotating into different assignments, we have incredible rotation programs. Go to boeing.com slash careers. And then I'll also say this, if any of you are members of any of the what we call external technical organizations, like NSBE, Women of Color in Technology, Black Engineer of the Year. I know Nesby's coming up next week. We actually have teams on the ground that will be hiring at all of those events. So you, get, you can actually get an offer on the spot. And we typically hire about 100 to 150 students at Nesby every single year. So please come to Boeing. And just like Vina said, if you can't, if you can't do anything else, find me on LinkedIn. I find the time to respond because um, I want to see every one of you at least spend at least one summer, um, if not one year at the Boeing company. So please come join us. I, I want to jump to where I see we have an audience question. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank Itoya and the Center of um, Digital Business. This is a great event. Be more for moderating and the panelists for joining us today. Uh, th this is really awesome. So my name is Jesse Peoples. I'm a Howard University graduate from, uh, with a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, currently, I am a chief security architect with Lidos, where I lead strategy, research, and development and implementation of advanced cybersecurity operations, uh, also known as Zero Trust. I spent a lot of time at Howard, especially talking to students. Um, and one thing, and I give you that background information because one thing I get is, hey, I see there's jobs out there I didn't apply because it didn't align with my major or my degree. I often tell them, you know, if you have a technical degree, if it's an engineering school, if it's in a business school, what that shows me is you're able to solve complex problems. So apply, apply, apply. And I say it three times because sometimes people need to sit, hear it three times to make sure that they do it. Um, you all touched on some of that earlier, a lot of good points. Uh, I would ask again, if you want to share, uh, again, where did you start, where are you at now, meaning if is it a degree, is it different than a non-technical degree that got you to the C-suite in a chief information officer position? And what being different, having that different background brought to the table? And lastly, if there's something that you need to say three times to this audience <laughs> to make sure that it's locked in, can you, can you please share it at this time? Anybody, and I, well, no, I'm not gonna say anybody. Russ, can I ask you to start? Because I've heard the stories uh, from Derek about the experience, and I know as an advocate and mentor, you're part of the reason why he is where he is today, so thanks. I'll tell you that he's a CIO, and he also made a CIO. Which, uh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think that, um, first of all, so you had a lot there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I think, you know, one, I think this panel has said that um, for as a entering, you know, professional, uh, one, bet on yourself. Um, and you should always believe that there's a seat for, you, seat for you at the table, right? So often we think we're along the, the walls and that's where we're supposed to be. No, you're supposed to be at the table. Right? So your journey is, in, and Venus talked about that, don't let people tell you you're not supposed to be at the table. You are supposed to be at the table. You're here to prepare for your greatness. Right? And so um, Derek talked about the fact that we uh, pull ourselves out of the running so often, particularly folks who look like us, because I think either we're afraid to be told no, but let that decision rides with somebody else. You shouldn't be making it for them, right? You should be standing in, in saying, I'm what you don't even know you need, right? You wrote that before you met me. So I'm the new prototype for the thing that you think you need. 
and that's the way you need to be approaching kind of your career is that um, there's a lot of folks who want to tell you no. But at the end of the day, you're the person who knows whether you can do it. Um, but also make sure you have that fire around, don't, don't apply for it and then not show up. That's the worst thing you could do, right? Is um, Nikki talked about she was in a job that she hated, but she also said she showed up every day and killed it, right? And so you have to build your brand. So that's the other thing, right? So when you, there's a, a thing, and Derek will, um, when, when I coach people, there's this framework I call pie, right? And so. Racial um, influence exposure. Pre yes, yeah, right. preparedness is what you're doing right now, right? The I is for influence. When you're in a room, are people like, okay, Venus is about to talk, she's gonna bring it. Let me, let me step back and listen, right? And so, um, it is how you influence the people that are around you. And then the last part of that is exposure, which is you need help from people like us to get you on bigger and bigger stages. So come prepared, be able to influence on your day to day. And when we put you on the stage, you gotta kill it, right? So each time we put you on a bigger stage, it's preparing you for your next opportunity. So Nikki talked about I think every six months, I mean, that's pretty impressive. So she was killing it on the stage and people were seeing her saying, okay, she's ready for the next thing, let's move her, right? And so I think as you find your opportunities, be prepared, be able to influence on a day to day, and when people give you the opportunity, show up. And I think what, what you need, like what can you do today is I think some of what you asked. So today, do you have a resume? That's my question. Because if you don't, I want you to use the University Resource Center and someone there can help you write a resume. Because when you apply for our internships and you have to put up, submit your application, we're often going to ask you for a resume. And you say, but I don't have anything to put on a resume. Yes, you do. Here's why. One, if you have in your class created a project that goes on your resume. Because a resume is not just for paid experience. I want you to capture your non-paid experience. If you had a job at Chick-fil-A, great, team member. It's not just that. So I want you to capture the skills that you're learning from your experience and make sure you include paid and non-paid. All of that works. I teach at the, the university in um, the community college in Virginia, and I often tell my students, all these projects that I give them with programming and setting up active directory, I make sure you put that as part of your skills. All the tools you used to create that project, you're a PowerPoint ranger. I need you to put PowerPoint all those skills. The other piece, what we're looking for, and I think I can, you can attest, whole person concept. I like that you have that 4.5 GPA, but I need you to also have some social skills. So I need you to show me where you have done some community service, right, because it's always about something bigger than yourself. So we look for the whole person concept. So yes, you have that skill piece, because you've had some jobs, but tell me where you've also done some community service. And so when you do that, now we get to see the whole person, and now that helps you to be competitive. And, and I know I want my teammates to weigh in. What do you look for for these internships? GPA is just one part. It's all the other stuff. Do you guys look for something different? You, we look for not just only GPA, but how eager the person is, you know, how, you know, how, how much, how, very, you know, when, when I talked to my recruiting team, I mean, Matt came and told me, I have this gentleman we met with and his desire for the job. We have to find him a job. We didn't talk about his GPA. We didn't talk about what his degree was. His desire to be a part of this company he hung around when everybody else left and waited for an hour to finally get to talk to me about the job. So it's the passion and the desire around, I really want to be there, I feel like I can make a difference. Great. I see we have an audience question. Thank you so much. So I just wanna say, Derek, I'm the floor, the manager of the early careers recruiting team for Maximus, and I wanna help you out a little bit. Hi. <laughs> Uh, so yes, we have a lot of internships and we hire from first year to senior. Sometimes the first year is struggle, 
and I get your pain. I was in 20 years in career services before I came to Maximus, so I'm the recruiting auntie that you needed. Um, and I really want to say that we do all those things, rotational programs, we've got some great opportunities for the early career space, and I've got my colleagues, where are my colleagues from Maximus? Raise your hands for more experienced hires here too. So at the networking piece, I just want to let Derek know you've got your team here. Yeah, so the expectation is we set up shop uh, at the Center for Digital Business um, over the next couple of months so we can begin to have that flywheel of talent that we can bring in. Um, because if we just get up here, we talk um, all, the, all the, the great messaging that came out, but we don't do our part, then we're, we're not going to be able to effectuate any change. So let's, let's, meet, let's meet the students halfway. So. Etulia, we'll be hanging out more with you for sure. I, I know we're running to the end of our time. I have a question that's off, that's not on the script, but it's something that you touched on earlier. And I know we have at least one uh, Howard faculty member in, in the, uh, from the School of Business in the audience. Derek, you mentioned uh, curriculum and how important curriculum is, uh, maybe some differences that you saw from your alma mater to what you're seeing across the board at, in other schools today. Um, going to a macro level on that question, I'd just like to ask you all, as we wrap up, to talk about and comment on what additions or changes to curriculum you think would prepare our students, undergraduate or graduate, to be most competitive in today's career environment in your field? So, so let me reframe the question and then I'll, I'll defer to my esteemed colleagues here. Um, there's definitely a difference between going to a PWI and the HBCU, that, that I know. Um, and, but I think we're, we're closing that gap um, as the years progresses, which is fantastic. But there, there is still a gap in some of the curriculum. So what I mean by that is um, the demand signals and things that you need to start a job um, if the curriculum is not commensurate with that, then you're not going to be successful. So uh, Linnea talked a lot about AI and there's things around autonomy. Um, it, there's a lot of things that are happening in the industry that we need, things around cyber. Um, if you're not learning those skills and not just theory, but practicality, how to do it in practice, then you're not going to be prepared to be competitive and you're not going to be able to compete with other folks that may be at a place that they are learning those skills there and they have a relationships with industry. So I think we, all of us need to do our part to make sure to, to, to go in and take a look at the curriculum for, for you. Take a look at the curriculum at other HBCUs to make sure that students are being equipped with the skill sets, both theory-wise, but also practically to be able to come out and compete, but also to be able to contribute. Because <laughs> if you can't contribute, then you're, you're kind of dead weight. And because of all the competition today, you, you won't have a job for long. Right. So it's about how are we going to prepare um, our, these young folks to be able to execute. I internalize that as a charge to industry to partner with academic institutions, starting at Howard, of course, because we love Howard. <laughs> I see a, a student question, please, ma'am. Hello. Um, so I'm an undergrad studying computer science at Howard. And yeah, I'm, I've been like paying attention to the panel. Some things that Mr. Pedro said really stood out to me, and also Ms. Goodwine. You mentioned like, um, not just looking for money, but also paying attention to like the impact you have at the company. And you mentioned like students bringing their curiosity like as young people. So I'm curious, is there a reason why it hasn't been disclosed that like Boeing support, um, offers or gives like ammunition to murder like Palestinians or Yemeni kids? Like what would be the human impact of black students working at these companies I'm also, I also have a specific question for Ms. Jones, who works in the CIA. You mentioned the Harriet Tubman statue in front of the CIA. Do you think there's a conflict when the CIA has historically like destabilized anti-colonial and anti-racist leaders? How does that fit into the framework of representation and the curiosity that black students should bring? Miss, I'm, I don't want to stop you. I, I know I had a hard time hearing you, and I think maybe the mask, and I don't want to pressure you to take your mask off, but I don't think I heard the full question. You had a question for three of us. Can you, you come in? Start bringing the mic. Speak closer. Yeah. Speak closer. Come closer, oh, or, or take the mask, or look loud. The, we didn't hear the all Okay, I could speak louder. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so my question, okay. 
So I have questions like based off some of the things that have been said. Um, so Mr. Ple Mr. Pleader, I hope I'm saying your name right, yes. mentioned um, paying attention to like the human impact of what you work or how you're working and I believe, and also like, sorry, hold on. And like yeah. mentors, successes and failures. So like what are the ethics of like blacks or why was it not disclosed that for example, Boeing makes like weaponry and ammunition which harm like black and brown people around the world, like currently Palestinians but also Yemenis in 2014. What are the ethics of furthering your career if these are like some of the human impacts and was there a reason why this wasn't disclosed? And also to Ms. Jones who mentioned like the Harry Tubman statue in the CIA um, is there like a conflict when the CIA has historically and currently like destabilized certain anti-racist and anti-colonial leaders like the statue of Harriet Tubman? So, so there's, there's a lot there. I'm just going to ask that um, we're going to be around after this so we can kind of address your question directly because it's very difficult to, to hear um, what you're saying. I want to make sure we can answer um, your, your questions in a meaningful way because I don't think any of us are prepared to be able to address all those things that you brought up. So can we just defer that to the, the conversation after this? Thanks. On that note, we're going to wrap up. Uh, the last thing I want to give you is I sat in your seat before. Uh, quick story, when, uh, when I was growing up, I watched BET, MTV, and when Bob Johnson sold BET, we were critical of why you're selling this channel that, you know, it's, it's our channel. And his answer was, when I went to sell BET, there was not a black buyer in the room. But when you go to sell your whatever, now there will be, because he had promoted himself to that seat. Okay, when I sat in your seat, and I was an undergrad, and I came and saw panels like this, this didn't happen. There, there, weren't, there was a cultural divide between who was coming to talk to us at HBCU, and they weren't people who culturally we felt we saw ourselves or could understand us. And you all, students now, have this incredible uh, advancement in that, in that sense. You have these people who are here who are culturally of you, who listen to the same music your parents did, <laughs> right? right? Maybe come from the same city you did, and I would say are ultimately more approachable uh, for your benefit than maybe the recruiters and those who came to give information were in my time at Howard. So I just wanna, if you wouldn't well, oblige me, just give this, uh, audit, this uh, panel a standing ovation and thank them so much for coming. And they will stick around to answer your questions afterwards. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you.